Hello everyone, I hope you are all having a fantastic day. Like my name is Ana, Ana Belén, and I'm very excited because this is the first day of talks in the tropical sunset. And today we have uh, the talk of Ethereum business readiness in 2022 with Dan Shah and Dan Burnett. Thank you so much. Thank you. All the Dans. Uh, Ethereum enterprise, you have to be called Dan. Uh, so, hi, I'm Dan Shaw from the Ethereum Foundation. Um, you know, I, I work with the uh, enterprise, uh, big businesses. Back in 2017, uh, at the launch of uh, the Ethereum, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, the EEA, uh, you know, Vitalik called for collaboration amongst private and uh, you know public. Um, uh, you know, to, to be able to support uh, enterprise needs. And, um, you know, I, I joined back in, um, in 2020 to come in and support those enterprise users. Uh, you know, when I came in, uh, there, there were some, you know, sort of big blockers for, uh, you know, going on, on mainnet. Um, you know, concerns around privacy, gas prices, and, you know, regula regulatory risks of uh, holding assets. Um, over the past year and a half, uh, I've been really happy to see uh, a massive sea change away from uh, only a uh, you know, private chain and you know, gradual introduction of uh, real, real mainnet adoption. But I really didn't know, you know what was going on. Uh, and I'm really happy to share what uh, uh, Dan Burnett and the EA have been working on uh, you know, to really you know, give us some proof, give us some data. Uh, and uh, I've been really surprised at, uh, at the maturity of, of what's going on. Uh, you know, things are, are, are farther uh, ahead and farther uh, on mainnet than uh, you might think. So, Dan Burnett. All right, thanks so much. Hello? Oh, there we go. All right. OK, thanks. Um, and I may ask you to put the f notes font size back to what we had agreed to. Um, all right. Thanks. Um, yeah. All right. So anyway, what I'm here to talk to you about today is a report that the EEA wrote, um, issued earlier this year, um, our Ethereum business readiness report. So you know, in the media, all the stories are focused on, uh, you know, popular media, right? All focused on crypto speculation, NFT speculation, uh, big collapses and things like that. But as the Ethereum ecosystem matures, more and more businesses are actually adopting the technology. Unfortunately, that story is not as visible to the general public, okay? And um, it's, as, as an organization that is committed to enabling uh, other organizations to adopt and use business, uh, Ethereum uh, in their day-to-day -day business operations, uh, we thought it was important to shed light on what's actually happening in business use of Ethereum today. So behind the DeFi, NFT, and so on headlines. Now, there are some challenges to this. In particular, day-to-day -day projects are all happening behind the scenes. Okay, Many of us know about them, or those who are sort of crypto savvy, but those outside of this room, outside of the, the crypto bubble, are definitely not aware of them. So our, our goal was to find them and quantify them, and that's, that's what we set out to do. So we did a, a, a mix of direct interviews, case study development, um, uh, surveys, um, and also the other uh, important part with this particular report was to be able to educate business decision makers about how to think about Ethereum-based deployments. So uh, the work that we did is based on both quantitative and qualitative research. We did the quantitative research, well, I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but the point is that uh, we focus primarily on the qualitative. Our goal was to, was to do storytelling based on case studies and interviews. And when I say storytelling, I mean stories that make sense to businesses. One of the reasons we focus so much on case studies um, is you know, everyone in this ecosystem likes to ask, well, what are the use cases, what are the use cases, what are the use cases? Use cases are for sellers. Case studies are for buyers. Buyers don't want to hear what you could do. Buyers want to hear what works today. So that was one of the, the uh, important goals that drove what we did. Um, so 
just very quickly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk through this part. Um, this is something that's in the report. Uh, we, from a business perspective, we describe kind of the, the history of the Ethereum platform as having three main phases. In the early days, of, of course, there's a lot of excitement, experimentation with, you know, decentralize all the things. And there's a lot of great experimentation that's still happening, of course. Um, but there was a realization pretty early on that there were some limitations from a business perspective in using the public mainnet. And in particular, the three that we always talked about, the three Ps, were privacy, permissioning, and performance. Those were things that the, the broader public community was not interested in focusing on at the time, but, but for businesses, are just absolutely essential. Okay, and that actually led to a focus on private blockchains, private consortium networks um, using Ethereum or, or other, uh, other technologies. Now, as we all know, there has been a great revival of interest in public blockchain, and this is actually from a business perspective also. That's driven by, of course, what we've seen with consumer DeFi, which is uh, demonstrated that decentralized business models can work. Um, also NFTs, but also some technological improvements. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. So um, before, I, um, before I talk about what's on this slide, I want to mention that from this point on, everything that I describe is being viewed through a business lens. Okay, so when I, when I show circles of certain sizes and so on, this is based on our particular data set. What we did is we, we collected a data set that was restricted to down to about 118 business-oriented Ethereum projects. These are projects, these are companies or projects that are active now, have live teams, and are developing solutions for traditional business problems. So the data set is somewhat small and eclectic, and keep that in mind when I, when I draw some conclusions like I do on this particular slide. Um, yes, please reduce the font size back down one or two. Thank you on the notes. Um, okay. Stop there. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, uh, okay, so on the left side here, what we have is the business projects organized by industry. And the lion's share, of course, has been in infrastructure and fintech, unsurprisingly. Um, we're basically still in, in the stage of building the platform and selling picks and shovels. Okay, I mean, that is really where the industry is, particularly from a business perspective. Now, if you look at use cases on the right side, most of the activity is in software development and fintech, which of course aligns with what I just said. And so, again, it's still early stages. There's a lot of need for building core uh, materials yet. So I just wanted to throw this up. Some people like looking at logos. Uh, this is a subset of the companies and projects that are in our database. I'm not going to talk about it. This isn't exhaustive, but just to give you an idea of, of uh, some of the, the companies and projects that showed up in that list of 118. Now, one of the things we wanted to do was, uh, well, look, if we're going to put out a report on business readiness of Ethereum, we have to define what business readiness means. Okay, so that was our first goal was to figure that out. And through the interviews that we did, we came up with um, a way to define it that we believe is, is useful for business. So our goal, keep in mind with this report, is to always to do two things, and education is one of those parts. So we wanted to make sure to educate people, and we also wanted to give businesses a tool as they evaluate uh, Ethereum technology and deployment possibilities. So we developed what we call our uh, Ethereum Business Readiness Framework. Um, and we think this is the first attempt that we're aware of to do this in a, in a neutral way, okay? So we're not selling anything in particular other than Ethereum, of course, right? Um, so what we ended up with is seven technical criteria, which you'll see in the, the coming slides, and three non-technical criteria with some detailed definitions, again, whose, whose goal is to educate a business audience. And through this, we believe that businesses can learn a lot about what is important and what to think about as, they, um, as they're considering deployments. Okay, so uh, down the left side here, and I know this is an eye chart. I don't expect you to read it. I'm just going to describe some of what's on here. So down the left side are our seven plus three criteria. They are, quickly, network cost, network decentralization and security, scaling, privacy, sustainability, usability, interoperability, and then regulation and compliance ecosystem resources, and ecosystem robustness. And from our perspective and all the interviews we did, 
those captured the factors that businesses cared about. We, it was particularly important to us to make sure that we included decentralization because a lot of businesses today just still don't even understand why that is something they should care about. Okay? So anyway, if you look at all these criteria on the left, not all businesses are going to care equally about those criteria. So the goal of this particular chart, uh, this particular uh, item, um, this section of the report, was to answer the question, which of these criteria are actually important to me? So what we looked at was four different types of businesses, as we call them. Large corporates, small and medium enterprises, startups, and then there's government, which is not a business, but they're, they're a category worth considering in, uh, in this discussion. So um, there are two things I want to highlight. So on the sustainability side, and I, again, I know you can't see all of these, but I just want to talk about a couple of them. So almost all businesses care about the environment. But governments and highly visible corporates care a lot because they can face very high and costly reputational risk, okay, if they, if they screw up sustainability nowadays. Um, on the security side, um, all companies, of course, want the best security. Um, but corporates and governments, uh, interestingly, they have a lot of resources to ensure security, whether it's financial resources, legal, technical, whatever. And so in some cases, and I know this is sacrilege to say it, okay, but in some cases they're willing to, uh, to sacrifice some decentralization in return for scaling. But that's not true for smaller businesses. In particular, one of the main appeals of blockchain technology is precisely the security against technical failure, attack, manipulation, uh, and so on that network decentralization offers. So they may be less willing to compromise in that particular respect. Now we did this because we wanted to show this before we got to uh, describing different architectures and where we think they fall. Okay, um, so what we did then was we, we basically evaluated those criteria against four different deployment architectures. You'll see we called it network archetype in the report. And what we're talking about is basic deployment architectures. The four categories, there are five columns, but there are four primary ones. There's the public mainnet, mainnet plus an L2, mainnet plus a sidechain, and private network. The second column is mainnet post upgrades. <laughs> because we put this report out, of course, before the merge, and there's a lot of other great stuff coming. And we wanted to make sure that people didn't look at the lighter uh, uh, the lighter uh, boxes here, which don't look so good for the public mainnet, and say, oh, yeah, that's always going to be the case. No, it's definitely not. And as we do this report each year, we're going to continue updating it in terms of where, where we're actually at. So a few examples here. Uh, from a network cost perspective, the cost to, to actually operate a private network can be very low. Even when you're running your own infrastructure, the, the actual operations cost can be quite low. Um, and we know the mainnet is expensive today. Okay, um, and that's being worked on, we know. Um, in terms of ease of use by businesses, uh, layer twos or side chains uh, actually have the most support, interestingly, um, because the ones who are building those layer twos or side chains um, provide a lot of information and a lot of help on how to make use of them. Uh, if you do a private chain, on the other hand, it's all on you, right? So it's not easy at all if you want to do a private chain. You have to do a lot of the work yourself. From a compliance perspective, a private network, it's the easiest to implement, you know, controls such as KYC, um, and, on, you know, the main net is, of course, fully decentralized on the other, on the other end. Um, so most of this shouldn't surprise you too much, but, again, this is written for, chances are, it's written for your customers, the people you're trying to sell to, and who need someone to explain this to them in a way that they can understand. Um, that did not do... Okay, all right. So one of the things we did was we wanted to give examples of how you might use this framework for a specific use case. And again, I know it's an eye chart. You can't see all these. It's all in the report. But um, we basically analyzed these criteria against um, the deployment architectures that, that I talked about. So for each of these architectures, we scored the criteria as very poor, poor, neutral, good, and very good, where good is out here and poor is in the center on these radar graphs. Um, so I'm just going to hit a couple of headlights. Um, so the upper left one is asset tokenization, and then payments, payment solutions is just to the right of that. So for asset tokenization, mainnet scores very high on usability and interoperability for tokenization. Um, but 
you know, if you have a project for which high performance and regulatory compliance are priorities, you'll want to be working with an L2 uh, or a sidechain, or, or you could consider uh, building a private network. Um, on the payment side, for payments use case, Ethereum is a payments network essentially out of the box. I mean, you know, finding information about how to do, uh, how to do payments with Ethereum or something built on top of Ethereum is not at all hard. But again, if you have high volume, you're going to want to work with a layer two or sidechain, uh, particularly if, you have, uh, if, you're, uh, if you're addressing retail customers. Now, interestingly, if you actually have a wholesale business, you might not need to go to that. And you could actually do a private network um, more simply today, more simply, more cheaply, if you have a, a wholesale business. OK, um, I said that we did interviews. Um, we actually have way more than six interviews. Um, but I just wanted to give a few examples of some of the people that we spoke with. Uh, we spoke with people who actually were building these projects. We also spoke with some well-known people in the space and probably some of the people here are in the room and I just haven't seen them yet. Um, but I just want to give you an idea of this. Within the report, we actually include quotes uh, throughout because we found that the quotes from these people are the thing that are, are the, they express this better than any of us could because they're dealing with it uh, every, every single day. So I've got, um, I've got three examples here. Um, and the one that I'm going uh, to actually call out is, is in the middle uh, from Benson of Acre Africa. Acre Africa provides parametric insurance for small holding farmers in Africa. So what they said is, we could have done this on our own with a database, but we wanted public proof that those triggers that the customer signed up for when buying are still the same ones used when it comes time to pay out. That is a great example of the transparency that you get from a, a good blockchain solution. So anyway, this is, this is just a few. We have a lot more. Um, but these interviews really helped us with the insights, which is what I'm going to get to shortly. Um, so we took that 118 projects and whittled it down to 12 for a super deep dive. Okay, So we were looking at doing case studies on, on 12 of them. Um, nine of the projects were ready for us to include them in the report, and three said, we want to be there, but not yet. Talk to us next year. OK, so we ended up with nine that are in the report. I'm not, I don't have time to go through them. I wish I did. Um, too short a presentation today. Um, but please do read it in the report, because there's a lot of great insights. For each one of these, we did a detailed case study and also put the key takeaways for a business audience again. OK? Um, so after all of that, we tried to distill everything that we had heard into some, some insights. So if you're going to take pictures of anything, it's probably this slide and the next one. So there is a growing appreciation now, um, publicly, right, of, of, of an ability to use the public blockchain. That is new. That's a, that's a really good thing to hear. And decentralized business models are beginning to make some sense because DeFi, right? So people realize there's something there. They don't know how to do, use it yet. They don't know how to, how to make it work yet, but, but they know there's something there that's important. Um, technological advances, ZK proofs, et cetera, are addressing the privacy concerns. And a variety of the, the upgrades coming or have already happened in, in the mainnet are going to be addressing the remaining business issues over time. But now, of course, we know that you need to use multiple, uh, multiple layers or multiple networks in order to address some of the performance and, and permissioning. Um, I want to talk about private and public uh, blockchain for a moment. Um, there are still, as I mentioned, some good use cases for, uh, for private blockchains, but we're beginning to see the use cases merge much more strongly than we've seen before. We're also beginning to see some hybrid options where people are using private for some things and public for others, and that's, that's, that's an interesting... Uh, an interesting result as well. One of the things we heard very clearly was that L2s and side chains are no one expects those to be a temporary solution. So even with everything that's planned in terms of upgrades for Ethereum, um, no one who is actually act building projects today believes that L2s and side chains are, are going to be temporary. They're expecting them to be here to stay, to, to you know, to remain. Okay. Um, when we first, when we did the, the research here, the number one blocker that was listed was sustainability across the board. This, of course, now, that's not the big blocker that it was because of the merge. So the second one is now the top one, and that one was regulation, and that's not, probably not going to surprise this audience, um, but it's interesting because it's actually not a blocker for all use cases. And um, it... You can, you can see some of the use cases where it's not in the report or catch me later and I'm happy to talk with you 
um, but there are some for which it's not an issue yet. And um, hey, NFTs are really making people aware of what digital assets are and can do, so that's, that's pretty neat. Um, and then the final comments I want to make are that, look, we believe, and this is going to sound obvious, right? We believe that the Ethereum ecosystem is ready for business. Of course we're going to say that. No, actually, here's the caveat. The caveat is it is not yet out of the box ready. That's the key result that we got. Um, okay, don't scroll that far, please. Um, all right. Um, so anyway, the good news is there are a lot of different options, right? There are a number of different architectures, and they're not bad. I know that this community is trying to push the, the edges. At the EA, we're trying to move the middle, okay? And so it's helpful for us to be able to explain that there are alternatives today, and, um, and those alternatives will get you moving, and you don't want to wait. There are good reasons to explore decentralized models, okay, um, of the, you know, and, and to take advantage of the processes of the type Ethereum makes possible. Um, one of the quotes that we heard was, since what previously relied on faith between two or more parties can now be proven mathematically on a blockchain, any situation in which someone has to say, I have to trust you, is an opportunity for a blockchain-based solution. Today, we increasingly see this being put into practice. Going forward, the opportunities are as numerous as the myriad business challenges that depend on this kind of trust. Okay, so here's my EEA slide. Um, on the left is free materials. On the right is what members get. I'm not going to walk through all of it, but I want to talk about on the left side, um, we have primers that we're putting out there. Basically, if you remember like the college, you know, uh, plastic two-sided sheet, cheat sheets were for algebra or whatever else. Um, that's what we're putting out, and they're targeted at non-technical business people, C-suites in general. We want to make sure they understand the trade-offs of the things that we're talking about. They are free to download and use. They're under our resources tab. We also have a large number of educational webinars, blogs. We hold events and so on. One of the things that we just uh, launched this week, it's brand new, so hit it hard and expect some problems, but we do want you to try it. Um, on our website, lower right corner, there's a chat uh, a chat icon. Um, look at some of the options that come up, but the reason we did that is that's intended to be a help desk. It is a help desk for business people. One of the things we heard most often from businesses was, look, I can call anybody that I do business with, but how do I call Ethereum? That is literally what they said. How do I call Ethereum? So our goal was to create a front end that makes it easy to answer some of those initial business questions that people have. Our goal is not to steer them to a particular provider, but to help get that initial understanding out of the way so when they come to talk to you, they have some idea what they're talking about. All right, and the last thing I wanna put up here is uh, there's lots more in the report. You can download it for free. That QR code will take you to that URL, which takes you to our website where you can, um, you can download the report. So um, with that, I'm going to see if Dan has uh, um, anything he'd like to finish with. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, so, you know, uh, for 2022, we got through uh, 100 projects and, you know, got down to, you know, just, just, a, uh, just a few of them. Um, you know, kind of the call to action is, uh, you know, if you have a project that you're working on, um, grab a Dan, any Dan will do. Uh, probably one of these Dan's, uh, or anybody at the uh, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, the EEA, and uh, you know, we, we'd love to uh, you know hear about your project and uh, you know, potentially include it in uh, uh, next year's report. Yep, Thank this you. was the first one. Keep sending them in so yep. we can we can do more. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dan and Dan, for this amazing overview of how the EEA has been impacting the enterprise adoption. Thank you so much. And so... Uh, Should we leave now? Okay. Yeah, but, Thank you. but there's some few minutes. Uh, okay. Maybe if there's questions. Uh, yeah, well, we have eight or five questions, so we can start there. Hi. We are going to give you the, the microphones. Yeah, for the people that don't want to hear. Hi, so um, can you share some specific examples of specific businesses who are implementing Ethereum today 
on a public or private uh, chain? Because you gave like more of a general overview, but I know. curious what? of specific I companies that are doing that, right? I understand, and they've just taken away my, my list with my notes where I left all the companies so I could answer that question with a whole bunch, but it's okay. Um, so um, one, of the, uh, one of the companies that, um, that we know of is Alaya. They did a, uh, a public uh, placement, I'm sorry, private placement using, um, using blockchain, and that was, that was very successful. Um, Microsoft uses NFTs to track components in their ser Azure server farms. So they basically do supply chain uh, tracking using an NFT for every single component. Not because, and, and by the way, they're doing this essentially privately, okay? They're doing it on a private network. But the reason they're using NFTs is because they found them very convenient as a, as a holder for information that they needed to carry along the, the process. Um, I mentioned Acre Africa, that's another one of my favorites. Um, Oh, gosh, let's see. So Which one of my favorites of is yeah. uh, the, uh, again, it's a, it's a Microsoft, Microsoft EY. Uh, you know, they, they've been uh, you know, really, really great partners and, and, and doing a lot of good work. Um, they uh, have taken all of um, the Xbox royalties that they would, um, you know, potentially give to EA Games and all, all the network that, that are uh, a part of, uh, you know, the Xbox network, and they've tokenized that, and what used to be, uh, you know, financial reconciliation that, you know, took months, uh, you know, now is, is a, uh, you know, smart contract driven, uh, instantaneous project, pro process that, uh, um, you know, it, it goes through the entire uh, supply chain, large and small, uh, you know, partners down the line, uh, you know, automatically get, get their, uh, get their fair share, and uh, just a, a fantastic example uh, and use case for, for, uh, for blockchain. And there's a lot more. I, I really do mean, you know, download the report. You'll, you'll get a lot more from that. Thank you. Okay. So the time is up, but oh. uh, sorry. <laughs> Come grab us. Thanks. <laughs> but you can ask for sure more things here. Yep. In, uh, all right. Thank you all. Thank you so much.